Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Dan. This Stone. is Dexter from the this Offspring. Is Nathan this East. is Sebastian Younger. This is David Lab. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillespie. I'm Chris This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. I'm Laird Hamilton. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Gray. Hey, I'm Mark Valley. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hi, this is Yuri Raitasalo. I'm a military professor from the Finnish National Defense University, and you're listening to the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero, Mark Valley, and Pete A. Turner. Man, this is super cool. One of the things I love about podcasting theory uh, is that we can we can reach out halfway across the world, or at least a third of the way across the world. It's six o'clock in the evening where you are. It's nine o'clock in the morning where I am, and uh, here we are, two uh, two people that study warfare, and and now we're going to have a conversation. Uh, Yuri, if you aren't familiar with him, you should definitely go to LinkedIn and look up his work. He's been published on War on the Rocks. He does a lot of, of writing in, in a variety of settings and styles. So I'll leave some of that work to you guys. But I wanted to get in with you because I, I don't want to waste any more time. Um, give us an idea of what you do uh, on a day-to-day basis and how it impacts uh, Finland and, and, and where they go in terms of security. Well, I think I have two main things. First of all, uh, I study, do research on on the transformation or on, of the character of war, mainly focusing on what the Western states are doing in the post Cold War era, or have been doing and are doing as as we speak. And the second part is take this research business and put it into practice and 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 do teaching, and then guiding some some other researchers on their own projects. Okay, cool. And when you say Western, the Western part of the uh, thing, is Finland included in that? Or are you guys sort of in between? Yeah, I, yes, Finland is included. Uh, quite a lot of my studies uh, concentrate on NATO, the United States, and, and most European states. So Finland is on, on the verge of that. It's a partner nation, not a member state. But of course, I have my own research interest in, in kind of uh, putting Finland into the perspective of, of European Union, NATO, and the West. Give us an idea, because one of the things that I don't have a good grasp of, and I'm sure the audience doesn't, is what is Finland's view? A lot of times in America, we're very self-loathing, and sometimes we're very self-loving. So give us kind of a sense of how you guys view America as a world partner, and then um, talk a little bit about Finland's role in NATO, in the in in the European Union, all these different areas. Talk about that after we talk about perceptions of America and Finland. Okay, well, if I start uh, start with my notions about the U.S. And, and some Finnish notions about the U.S., I think everybody understands here that uh, the United States is the only global player, politically or militarily, uh, 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 the only military great power that has uh, uh, global interests and, and the ability to operate globally. So I do think that uh, it's appreciated that uh, if there is going to be a military crisis in Europe, everybody understands that uh, the United States is going, hopefully, going to be the main player uh, to, to solve it. So I, I do think that there is a lot of appreciation uh, for the United States here, here in Finland and, and in Europe uh, as, as, a, as a whole. What do we do? What do we do? How do we view security in Finland? I do think that uh, we have done some little bit more modest changes to our military military posture and, and military doctrine during the post Cold War era than than most European states have. And I do think that that's based on on our, our geographical location next to a, a great power, which is a military, military big actor. And also because we have our own big geography, we are quite big state, quite small population. So we are doing, we are doing mostly the uh, territorial defense, uh, defense capability, constructing, constructing it and, and maintaining defense capability for the defense and deterrence purposes. So we haven't been going that much out of area doing expeditionary missions than maybe most states in Europe have. What's the population of Finland? Five five point five million. Okay, so so it is rather small. I mean, it's we have we have whole cities that are bigger than that. Is there a concern about Russian invasion into Finland since you guys share a border? I mean, I know obviously you're focused on home defense, but is that a problem? Like we have Mexico and we have a constant incursion of of people coming across for the opportunity. I don't know that that's the case for you guys, but is a border security a serious uh, strategic concern for you guys? 
Well, I think that if you look at Russian borders, the, the border with Finland has been the, the most stable and the most well-guarded one. So we haven't had uh, practically any problems with, with border security. But of course, the rising tensions that we have witnessed in Europe for the last four years, that is, that is a concern. It is mostly a political concern. It has some economic aspects as well. Uh, we have taken uh, a little bit of a hit on, on the sanctions and so on. But it, of course, it's also a defense matter. Uh, if things start going sour, of course, we want to be ready so that uh, we have a credible defense and no threats uh, will come to us. That leaves a good foundation for what we're about to discuss now and, and sort of what what are we looking for? I mean, we've seen Russia roll into the Crimea and, and, have, and create conflict there. And from my point of view, and you're welcome to disagree with me, tank on tank, state on state battles are... I hate to say a thing of the past because we've tried that in the past and that's proven wrong, but they're a lot less likely. The fight we fight is much more complex and uh, not as big. It's not a, platoon, a platoon of tanks taking on another platoon of tanks as much as, as some of my military peers want that to be the case. How do you see, how do you sort out the, the complexities of what's next in, in modern conflict? Well, I agree with you on, on the notion that uh, state on state wars, tanks on tanks have become have become margin, marginalized after the Second World War, actually, during the last 70 years. So we, we haven't seen too many of those cases. We have seen some, but not too many. The vast majority are internal conflicts, insur insurgencies and, and so on. But I, I don't think that uh, just because you count more of these uh, newer versions of, of wars, that they are more important. Uh, at least from our perspective, uh, I can really see one big strategic imperative, and that is preparing uh, preparing the military and, and the defense side so that there is not going to be uh, a war. So it's, in a way, it's kind of a preventing threats from emerging, and that, that is the main reason for having military capability and defense capability in Finland. So I agree with you in part, but I wouldn't uh, draw the conclusion that, that, that the most frequent wars are the, the most necessary or, or most strategically important. And I'm, I'm, I'm also talking to the U.S. Uh, uh, just, to, just to maybe get the conversation going. I would argue that uh, some of the military operations the U.S. And, and many other Western states have done during the post-Cold War have actually not produced too many uh, positive security outcomes. So I would say that I would call uh, I would say a little bit more restraint on using the military forces. Yeah, we definitely struggle to create a repeatable and reliable outcome, especially in terms of creating stability. We, we hate to turn nation building, but the reality is, is when you someone has to go back to Syria and help them get back up on their feet. Otherwise, as far as we know, they're going to stay mired in conflict and, and instability for generations. Do we need it? Yeah, but it, yeah, but it's going to be difficult. You know, I think it was John Mershammer who has been calling uh, the nation building kind of a military social social engineering, and I, I do think that he has a point because I do think that uh, when you are using uh, military forces, armed forces, uh, violence in some cases, large scale violence to produce social or political outcomes, it's it's really it's really difficult. You know, military power does not easily translate into a politically and socially acceptable outcomes. In, in many cases, it actually, actually makes things worse. I, I definitely I definitely agree with you there. I've seen a lot of, of great intentions from, from allied military forces. When we go to Afghanistan, you know, the French aren't trying to mess up. The Romanians aren't trying to mess up. But we don't even have an aligned purpose. So you have Romanians running around afraid of getting killed, which is, of course, very realistic. And so they're out driving over the top of Afghan vehicles, killing Afghans with their trucks. And and just scaring, scaring the Afghans so bad that we were getting reports that they thought the Russians had invaded. And and that that doesn't create stability. What... But what do we do, though? Like, with a commander, their job is to impose their will, right? Like, whether it's a Finnish commander, an Italian commander, American, they're supposed to impose their will, and you're trying to nurture growth from the local government. How do you reconcile that? Well, I think that uh, we have a problem that we have to analyze it on, on, on several levels. I think what you're talking about is kind of the operational level of how do you do the operation after you get the, the political decision, what, what needs to be done. Um, my main focus in my own own, own area of, of, of doing things and doing research has been on a strategic level. 
of what should states pursue with their defense policy, what kind of goals can they actually succeed in, in doing. And I, I do think that uh, if uh, a commander is given the task of doing nation building uh, and providing stability and security in Afghanistan or some other place, I think, of course, it's his job to do his, do his best. Uh, but, but there could be the situation where he has a task that he or she will never be able to accomplish. Just what, what, what you mentioned, uh, so many nationalities in one operation. Uh, I think that during the, during the main phases of, of ISAF in Afghanistan, there were something like 50 plus states in the same operation. And of course, everybody understands that from a commander's perspective, from an operational perspective, it's a nightmare trying to reconcile different cultures, different military ethos, different kind, different ways of, of looking at things and, and doing operations, having having some caveats. So so that is the problem of, of getting a big coalition of very different kind of actors with different interests into the same operation. I'm glad that you talked about the strategy and the outcomes. One of the things that I've noticed is that our theory and our strategy rarely links with the tactics on the ground. And this kind of goes back to where we started with this whole thing with this on the American side, we've got a security blanket with our tanks, with our artillery, with our military dominance. I mean, this is what kind of makes state on state fights obsolete because who can afford to fight like that in terms of attrition and and materiel and and money? It, it's very very hard. So when we get down to the tactics on the ground, what does the U.S. military train on? Well, a unit, a tank unit about to deploy to Afghanistan that's going to partner with and spend most of its time engaged with Afghans in teaching, training, creating capacity, they're going to go to our national training center and they're going to practice tank on tank fights and literally never touch a tank outside of the camp the entire deployment. So they actually don't work on the tactical skills that might lead to success. And then the other thing I've realized and took your comments on this is from tactics, the leap to ground truth is enormous and we are terrible at understanding if the tactics we are training actually connect with the reality on the ground. What are your thoughts on that whole concept? Well, I've been following the discussion in the, in the U.S. and also in Europe. Uh, and I would say that, uh, of, of what I understand it, uh, that uh, during the last uh, almost 20 years, there has been a shift. Uh, it has been a quite a remarkable shift of, of moving away from tank on tank thinking, doctrines, and, and uh, instigating this notion of counterinsurgency and, and war amongst the people or three block law, war, however you want to call it. So actually, I do think that. Uh, not so much maybe in the U.S., but quite a lot in Europe. We have actually seen the loss of the of the tank on tank perspective, the big war perspective, in a way. Uh, and in a way, that is problematic because if there comes a situation where big wars are coming back, it will take uh, a generation to reinstate the big war perspective. Uh, all the capabilities have been axed. For example, in Europe, militaries have gone professional, which means they are very small. Uh, in, in many cases, they are tiny. And then they don't have the equipment, nor the training, nor the ethos. So it will take 20, maybe 15, 20, 25 years to get it back. In the U.S., you have the capability. But I would say that uh, you have quite a lot also uh, changed the mindset uh, and the training as well. Uh, and as, I see, as I've been looking at the discussions uh, and debates in the U.S., there has been also the, the, the kind of the worry within the military and the defense establishment that it, it is going to take quite a long time uh, to get rid of the wear and tear that the Afghanistan and Iraq and other operations have done for the military capability. And then, in a way, getting the at least some of the, the big war mentality back. Yeah, the big war mentality is is the thing. Um, and, and as we're talking about, you know, less state on state war and less tank based fighting, you know, here's Russia invading the Crimea. And so we have to always kind of keep this root of, of if you don't focus on this capability, someone will take that advantage and enhance their ability to uh, achieve a strategic win by just relying on that multi-generational deficit in training. And that's, that's a real thing. But how do, you manage, how do you manage the resources to maintain enough traditional capacity and yet deal with the, like we talked about, the extreme cultural complexity of dealing with a, a Syrian 
nation building operation, creating stability in the uh, Horn of Africa, all these other places that we need to try to create stability to to handle our theoretic and strategic goals. Yeah, well, as I see it, uh, you know, I think it was really logical uh, for the first 20 years after the end of the Cold War. There was really nothing that that meant that there was uh, any need for uh, big war capability for most most Western states. So I think it it has been rather in a way a systematic uh, way that they have dismantled a lot of this capability and, and doctrines and so on. But if I look at the situation in the world today and and project it into the future, I would say that for the United States and for the West, uh, we must uh, kind of recognize that uh, the the great power rivalries are coming back. I think for the U.S. it's going to be long, long-term long main rival is going to be China. Whether it's just rivalry or competition uh, or whether it goes into the military sphere as well, we, we will see. But I think that the United States needs to focus on, 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 on great powers more than it has so far. China, number one, uh, on the short term, it's Russia. It's, it's in Europe as we speak. But I think that the prospects for Russia's future are, are rather bleak. So if you look at the, the demographic, we look at economics. Uh, and we look at the innovation, the, the power of, of tra- attraction, the soft power, they are all kind of going down. So so, so this is, I, I do think that uh, you can't control all the bad things uh, and all the security issues in the world with the military. So you have to narrow your focus. And I would say that you have to narrow your focus now, uh, trying to show restraint, do get rid of some of the operations that are ongoing and, and not to start new ones unless vital national security interests so demand. Okay, yeah, no, that's, yeah, vital security interest. And I guess we could talk about that too. But I, you mentioned China, and since North Korea is probably the most, at least from our point of view, you know, given that they're a, a nuclear power now and they have what appears to be an ICBM, what what do we do? I mean, I, we've, we've had Dr. Taguchi on the show, and he's a force planner in the U.S. military. He's retired now, but he talked about maintaining a status quo with North Korea because Kim Jong-un, as crazy as he is, he's the guy we know. We, we have the networks built up to understand what he's doing. But how, how do you, as, as a scholar, and how do you, as, as a person from Finland, how do you size up this North Co- Korean chess match? Yeah. Well, you know, as, as you mentioned, it's easy for me to give advice, looking at it from Finland, uh, and to, to see how this influences the United States. But, uh, but I would say that, and, and I do sincerely believe that... Uh, Kim Jong-un's regime is a rational actor, a rational state actor, which is very repressive, authoritarian, dictatorial uh, system. But still, I do think that uh, they have their own survival at stake all the time, and that is what they think about when they do their move. So I don't think that it is crazy actor that would just launch a nuclear or conventional war out of the blue just because uh, they feel like it. So in a way, I do think that deterrence is one way of containing uh, North Korea. Uh, the other part, I would say, uh, we have given quite a lot of, of uh, time and, and exposure to North Korea. Uh, up, up until the very latest uh, uh, nuclear tests and missile tests, I think that we should have uh, maybe not given, uh, not respond so actively all the time when they do their move, because that is what they want. Uh, when they fire their missiles and they do their nuclear tests, that, that is what they want. They want to be part of the discussion. They want to be... Uh, they want to be uh, included in the discussions, and, and now, as we are seeing this new phase about some uh, reconciliated comments, uh, it is a game, uh, and they are trying to play with their very bad hand. Uh, uh, they are not doing that badly either. Yeah, they're not doing that badly, but you're right. They they struggle as a regime to feed and provide for their people. And then we as the world kind of, what we do, we squeeze out all the rest of the stuff to make it possible. So then they have to work with the only other players on the board that will work with them, which are all of the, the most nefarious, uh, <laughs> underhanded type types of people to survive. And so it does sort of create this well of, of bad things that, that ultimately has to be dealt with by somebody. Is that... Is, when we get to these kind of things where like Syria just continues to get worse and worse and the Horn of Africa, and I'm just picking a couple places that yeah. matter to us, but is that the U.S.'s job to bring its allied power? Brad, Brad company to the day I die.
Hey, it's Pete A. Turner from The Break It Down Show. If you're in Southern California this weekend, I want you to come check out Brad Company's latest event at Los Cabos Sports Bar and Grill in Wake Forest. This weekend, it's Dave Hatch's birthday, so Brad has put together a show featuring comedians Matt Malaker, Bo McFarlane. Of course, Brad's going to be there, and we're even going to get David Hatch to do a set. That's at Los Cabos from 7 to 9 on April 28th. And if you're one of the many fans from all over the world who can't quite get there, do me a favor. Check in on Brad's live stream channels. Give a quick high five as he broadcasts Saturday night. That sure would mean a lot to me. Hey, back to the show. To these places to try to create stability so that that, that instability isn't exported? Well, my personal opinion is that it's not the U.S. job, but but I do understand that that many people around the world uh, and also many people in Europe expect the U.S. to lead. So there are there is a lot of expectation that uh, if if something can be done, whether it's militarily or uh, otherwise, uh, everybody is looking at or most most states, at least within the Western security community, are looking at the United States. So it kind of builds a little bit of pressure. But I would say also that uh, the mainstream view within the United States uh, foreign policy establishment uh, has been that active engagement is something that is that is called for for the credibility of the U.S. Uh, global uh, position and so on. So there is a kind of this reinforcing processes outside and inside of the U.S. that have facilitated that the United States, United States has been very involved in the security dynamics during the last 25 years. And I, my personal feeling is that the, the dynamic is about to change uh, and uh, it's going to be more defined by the, the bigger players that have been absent for 20 years, but have now in a way re-emerged. China is do, doing the, the long-term growth path and, and Russia uh, now playing very actively and, uh, and aggressively, aggressively also uh, against the interests of, of many Western states. Does Russia's aggression is that linked directly to Putin's involvement? And then is is it is there a movement back towards a less aggressive, more more I guess collaborative Russia once once he's no longer in power? Is that a fair assumption? Well, I don't know. Uh, is it going to be easier or more difficult uh, uh, with with the next leader who comes after Putin? Uh, I I don't I don't think that we have too many too many kind of ideas how that's going to turn out. But I would say that. Uh, the important thing is that it's a dynamics. So it's not only about Russia, and it's not it's not only about the West, or it's not only about China. It's always a dynamic that has met, uh, at least two, in most cases, more players. If you look at Syria, I don't even know how many players there are at the moment. There are dozens of uh, interests. There are dozens of groups using military force for their own interests. So uh, Syria has become a mess that is really hard to solve. And in a similar vein, this aggressive behavior by Russia against Western interests, it is something that uh, one state or one actor cannot cannot solve, and it, you can't blame everything on just one actor. Yeah, that's for sure. Although here in the U.S., we, we like to blame <laughs> we like to blame our president. He certainly uh, creates some intrigue and some excitement around here, and uh, I, I guess I, I owe it to the audience to ask, and you don't have to answer, but what, what would you say overall is the Finnish impression of our president and, and of what the U.S. is doing right now as a country? Well, I, as I understand it, uh, if, if we look at the policies, most of the policies show, in a way, a continuation of older policies. There are some uh, very kind of uh, media hype things where the president comments uh, a little bit differently than, uh, or quite a lot of differently than, than his predecessors. But, uh, but I do think that uh, there is quite a lot of continuity uh, in, in the actual policies and the practices uh, of what the U.S. is doing. Uh, so there are, of course, you know, tariffs uh, on steel and aluminium and so on, si- singular things, uh, not uh, ordinary in a way, but, but, but a lot, a lot of continuity. So in a way, the first ex- uh, expectations after the elections uh, were maybe a little bit worse than what has been actually uh, the, the policies that uh, how people judge them. Let's talk about hybrid warfare and be done with the presidential conversation. Give me an idea of what, as an expert, actually, let me let me read this one piece to you from your piece on Roar on the Rocks, because I, I thought this was really interesting uh, as you tried to describe the hybrid warfare, warfare concept and its viability. But the the Russians' ability to 
to create information campaigns and cyber attacks. So you, so you wrote, second, it's been argued that information campaigns and cyber tools at the disposal of Russia have had a significant influence on the crisis in Ukraine. This is from 2015. And so far, no one has convincingly shown the real tangible effects of Russian information warfare, its army of internet trolls, and the use of other cyber attacks. How has that statement held up over the last couple of years? Well, for me, I have been a little bit puzzled that when we look at the crisis in Ukraine, both the Crimean Peninsula first, which was a military operation, even even, even if people call those green men, you know, uniformed, highly armed, uh, military organized uh, people coming in. Uh, so, so it was a military operation, and we have we have seen a military operation continuing in the eastern Ukraine for four years. Uh, and quite a lot of the discussion is about uh, information warfare and hybrid warfare. I, my my point is that actually there is going very conventional, long-term attrition warfare as we speak in eastern Ukraine. Uh, and if you look at the reporting by the OSCE, uh, every every day there is shelling by by mortars by artillery, rocket launchers, some tanks, and so on. So it is rather old-fashioned attrition warfare, low-key, but still attrition warfare. And I haven't seen any tangible results from the Russian information campaigns. Uh, everybody, for example, concerning the crisis in Ukraine, everybody knows in the West and understands that Russia is fighting a proxy war there. There is no, no doubt about that. Uh, uh, Russia has become, in a way, a pariah state. Uh, uh, it is politically, economically quite isolated as we speak. So I don't think that it has been a success. And as, uh, at the moment, it looks like the, the, the military operation in the eastern Ukraine isn't going that well either. So, so I don't see uh, how this information or cyber warfare uh, thesis about Russia's action is, is playing out even today, if, if we look at Ukraine. Then we can talk about the United States and the election, all that. Uh, that is another question. Yeah, sure. Like, like that, that definitely is the natural segue, right? Is is then if it's not working there, is it working or did it work in the U.S.? Yeah, I think there is a there's a quite a lot of hype about the, the information tools, uh, the troll armies still t today, and also also cyber warfare. But I haven't seen cyber warfare uh, today. What I have seen a lot of. Uh, Cyber criminality, 95% or 99% about cyber cyber incidents have to do with criminal activity, uh, and and uh, it's targeted against normal persons, citizens, and, and uh, companies, uh, enterprises, and and so on. Of course, there's espionage and all kind of uh, all kinds of uh, stealing of uh, confidential material and so on. That, that that is the part of the business. But cyber warfare, uh, I haven't seen I haven't seen any reporting on that. Some people, you know. Uh, take the Stuxnet as an example uh, of the centrifuges in Iran, uh, and, and the, some others talk about the Bronze Warrior situation in Estonia ten years ago. I, I wouldn't say that uh, that constitutes warfare in, by, by any definition. War is somehow related to the, the use of, 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 of violence, large-scale violence. Cyber domain is a new domain. Uh, it's going to in, have an impact on warfare in the future. But you know, it was already in 1993 when Rand Corporation published the article that cyber war is coming. 25 yeah. years ago, so it, it's going to take some time. If warfare involves violence, I'm a counterintelligence guy, right? So I'm a spy. So so I'm sometimes collecting to create a targeting package to create mm -hmm. violence on someone. But sometimes I'm looking at benign things to give a sense for what's going on in town, so that we don't just focus on threat. Am I conducting warfare if I'm in a conflict zone and I'm collecting something that doesn't lead lethal consequences driven by my commander? So, yeah, yeah, I think that you could do as, as a person or as, as a platoon or, or at the company level, you could do many things in a crisis or in a war that are not violence related. But I would say that you are not in a war zone if there is not the, the constant threat and the use of large-scale violence. I think that is something else. It can be a crisis, it can be a conflict, uh, it can be a competition, whatever. But if there is not the threat and the use of violence, how does that constitute war? What, what, what kind of differentiates influencing somebody and then and waging war? I do think that influencing somebody or trying to influence other actors, that's normal politics. You use information, you argue, you lie, 
you you bribe, you do all many nasty things as well. Yeah. But 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 that that's normal politics. That's how international relations work. States are not all always thinking the best of others. They are thinking the best for themselves, and and they are. Uh, trying to fulfill their national interest. Yeah, you know, I'm glad you brought that up. One of the things that I've discovered through my own work, there's several elements to winning a modern conflict, and obviously militarily is, is one of them, and it probably leads the way, because if you don't have military dominance, you're not probably not going to win. And then you have to win the fight culturally, socially, politically. You have to account for religion in all of these things if you're really going to create a positive net effect and and dominate so like the taliban is able to minimize its interaction with all of the allied presence there they're able to intimidate through religion and through social and cultural and 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 actually security presence i mean it's hard to beat those guys back they just come back as soon as you turn your back they walk back up so they won't engage you but they will engage the populace and so the fight has become from my perspective that and this drives my Klaus Witze and friends crazy, but the center of gravity is the, is the civil populace in terms of the modern conflict that I've seen. Is it correct for me to say that? Can can the objective of the fight, the civil populace, be be something that, that, that we have to fight over and that is a different kind of warfare? Well, I do think that if you look at the ongoing operations or wars, Afghanistan being one of those, at the operational level, that is the case. But for me, it's really important that before you engage in such an operation and give the commander his task, what, what he must accomplish, you must have a strategic think about what is our strategic level interest in this? Are they achievable with the use of military force and other means? And, and how do we define victory? What is, that, what is the case that we are actually seeking to achieve? And when we achieve it, what do we do then? Uh, I, and I don't, I haven't seen a lot of that done in a very convincing way uh, during the post Cold War era. So I would say that in many cases, military force has been used too lightly, with with not enough liberation about the consequences. Uh, if I could just cite the operation in Libya, 2011, as an example, I think it was a, a massive, massive failure for European and Western security. We are going to feel the consequences of that operations for decades to come in Europe. Yeah, I mean Libya is a, a, a hour-long flight to Rome, you know, from one to the other. So the proximity is is terrifying when you look at what's going on with humanity just a, a few hundred kilometers away, and you're talking about a lot of damage and and, uh, and yeah. negative things. One of the things that I figured out through my own work is that affect beats effect. And you talked about in your War on the Rocks article, the introduction of effects-based approach to operations is indicative of what has been wrong in the post-Cold War Western understanding of war. And then you go on about political goals and that kind of thing. Uh, this episode of the Break It Down show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at PDA Turner. Or at John LG69. At the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. Again, if the civil populace is going to be a central theme, and, and we don't seem to have these open fields to fight in, you know, state on state, division on division, um, how how do we... How do we create the desired affect, the response to stimuli that we want? I mean, we can't just count dead bodies because that doesn't lead yeah. to victory. We've learned that over and over again. How do we collect the minds that we need to collect? And not for ourselves. Like, Finland doesn't need Afghans to believe in Finland. They need Afghans to believe in the Afghan government. How do we – and is that, a, is that a correct – approach is to get help afghan leaders collect afghan elders is that the correct thing or would you say it's something and again i'm putting you in a tactical uh mindset yeah. but that's that's kind of where you and i have to figure out how strategy and tactics link yeah that's okay but you know b before answering that uh, i would like to say just you mentioned uh, my critique of the effects-based approach to operations uh 
during the post Cold War, and that, that shows some kind of a, a mistake within the Western Western security community. I, what I mean by that is that uh, every time you start waging war or you start the new military operations, you actually should have the effect in your mind. What is this supposed to uh, influence? What are the outcomes that we are seeking with the use of military force? So for me, to have to coin a concept that you actually have to define the effects that you want is, is something that is uh, absurd because I think every good uh, strategist and a campaign planner would first think about what do I want to achieve? What are the effects that I want to get to? And then start thinking, what do I do militarily and using other means to get that? So I, I, I do think that the effects are always in your mind when you are planning whether or not to go to war and when you are waging war about how, how you will get your objective. So that, that, that was the reason that I criticized this, this notion, because I think that, that, that it's, it's one part of the puzzle, puzzle uh, when you wage war. Then, then what to do in Afghanistan? Uh, well, I think uh, I, have no, I have no, you know, the operation has been going on for, for almost 17 years, so I have no kind of a new, fresh idea how to win the war there. But, uh, <laughs> But my, but my own kind of uh, instinct tells me that uh, uh, it should teach us at, at least that uh, many of the many of the goals that we we uh, and I am talking on behalf of the 50 plus states that have been being a part of the operation, we should really think about uh, what kind of results can we achieve uh, in, with the military operation, and in which cases are we actually making uh, making uh, the situation worse. So trying to look back, uh, and this is easy for me, looking at in re retrospect, uh, uh, I think that the, the first part of the operation, which lasted for something like six months, was beating down the Taliban regime. Uh, I think that went really well. I, I, I was really surprised how, how, how well that went. But after that, I think that uh, there has been, in a way, a mission creep, uh, partly because the Taliban has been able to come back, as you, as you mentioned, uh, finding refuge and then coming back. But I do think that uh, uh, the lesson learned for me is that uh, long-term big forces on the ground doing stability uh, in most cases will not work. And if it's culturally very different place that we are accustomed to, like Afghanistan, uh, we have no real good knowledge uh, about the culture or understanding. You know, we have been trying to, uh, we tried to uh, build a central government in, in, in a country that never had one. So, so I, I do think that uh, the, the big lesson learned for me is that uh, minimize this kind of use of military force. When we move as a as a world entity and we try to help Afghanistan, because when you have 15 nations partnered, that's that's about as worldly as we can get right now. What's is Finland doing enough? I mean, I know you guys have a small force; you're five million people in the whole nation. What's when you show up, what what can you accomplish? What part? What's your guys' role in a multinational, you know, goodwill festival that uh, Afghanistan is? How do you guys do what you do, and are you doing enough? Well, are we, are we doing enough? That, that's a good question. I, I think that uh, it's a political decision every time whether or not to go, and I I do think that uh, at least in Finland. Uh, there is always the deliberation about uh, what will our presence bring to the operation. Of course, it will bring, uh, in, in every case, it brings some amount of legitimacy. The more more people or more, more states participating, it gives leg legitimacy to the operation. But I do think that uh, there is the de deliberation about uh, what can we bring to the table uh, that, uh, that, is, that is beneficial for the operation. So if, if you look back, for the last 25 years, the number of, of uh, participation has gone down. Uh, I think we uh, said something like uh, 1,500 uh, plus or minus in, in the 90s to different operations, and now the, now the figure is something like 500 soldiers in, in different missions. So, but I would say that the, the well, the numbers have been going down. Uh, the, the level of difficulty of the missions and what the soldiers are doing on the ground has gone up. So uh, I do think that uh, we we try to do we try to do it's it's part showing solidarity it's uh, sh showing solidarity to the people on the on the ground where where the operations are taking place but it's also showing sol solidarity 
to international community, uh, to European Union, NATO, and so on. That's a great answer. That really, like, that's it's uh, it's it's such a great conversation to have with you. I mean, I, I'm really enjoying kind of picking your brain about things, and I, sort of I, it's been one on one on one. But do you, if you want to ask me a couple questions, I'm glad to take a couple stabs at things. I mean, clearly you've got a deep understanding, but I, I don't want to just uh, hammer you this whole time. Do you want to return serve? Yeah, well, you know, I'm I'm fascinated by the kind of the notion that, as as you mentioned several times, that. Uh, that uh, if we are looking at it from a, from an operational or, or tactical level, that what what can we do? So you have a, a good history with that. So what, what would be your suggestion? Uh, is there is there a fight going on in Afghanistan uh, of or, or potential operation in Syria that that is actually doable on on a tactical or operational level? Yeah, I I, I think about this quite a bit because it's an exceptionally challenging answer, and and right. you know who knows if Pete's answer is the right one. The one thing I know, and and then if if we do have to have a conflict in North Korea, someone has to go there and and help help to try to get those people up and on their feet. Does that need to be a military operation? I don't know, but does it need to be secured by the military? Probably. So if you're going to go out, because you can't, we know this, you can't roll in with tanks, kill a bunch of people, pull out and expect a good outcome that that yeah. you want. So uh, given that, yeah, you have to have the ability. My my, my partner and I wrote a, a peer reviewed paper. It's actually going to be uh, published in a, a Scandinavian journal. Um, and really? we talked about, yeah, we talked about female engagement on the battlefield and, just that alone, we called it female empowerment partly because the conversation is already starting once you say female empowerment because the Western side, the women, will will attack me and say, which women are you talking about? Our women or their women? Like, okay, their women. Like, they're already empowered. Women are empowered. Like, you're fighting with me. <laughs> I'm, like, this is how complicated this stuff is like i'm not saying that women aren't empowered i'm saying if we're going to go into a foreign place with limited understanding of their culture no understanding of their of their translate or their language their religion um then then we have to slow down and get things right one of the things that we don't do well at least in the u.s military and i don't know about you guys but is there's all kinds of advanced step-by-step specific training on how to shoot a gun, how to deploy a claymore mine, how to drive a tank. All these things are very, very specific line item. Like this is how you do this. You know, this is how you move 80 pounds. This is how you uh, create company in the defense against the, you know, there's all this doctrine written, but no one can show me the doctrine written for how do you manage an interpreter and and turn them into a valuable asset. It's all based on fear and and corruption and not being reducing risk as opposed to increasing stability. So if we are going to go do these things, we've got to balance the equation a little bit and and in pre-deployment training, you can't as an artillery unit, you can't just shoot artillery rounds and practice something that you're not going to use on the battlefield because that's, well, that's folly. If you think you're going to go into such a complex fight and and treat the familiarization and the operation and the partnering with a foreign nation as, as I don't know how it is in Finland, but I would imagine it's the same way as it is in the U.S. Um, even special operations type people, SEALs, they're going out all the time and getting into firefights. They will fire fewer bullets than they will have conversations with the locals. Let me say this in a different way. They will have more conversations directed at partnering and stability than they will fire a lethal projectile at the enemy. That's just what happens. So we have to find a way to balance the training and the tools that we have in a way that makes sense. Does, and, and if that means sacrificing some of our tank proficiency, hey, Pete is fine with that because I've not seen a tank on a battlefield in a long time, and I've never seen a tank get fired on by a tank in my time in the military. So that's a bit of a long answer, but I, I th- does that make sense? Yeah, and I, I would like to raise one point. You, you mentioned that in many cases, for example, if something happened in North Korea, that maybe the military tool isn't the right one, but military is going to be the secure uh, and so on. And I think that is a good point because 
militaries are maybe not kind of meant to do most of the stuff that they have been doing for the last 25 years, nation yeah. building and so on. But they are the only ones that have some kind of a tools to do something. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the problem because if you look at, for example, the, the fragile state index, which classifies states, for example, well, all over the world, uh, how, how stable or fragile they are. If you look at Africa alone or the Middle East, you can try something like 30 states that are very fragile. So if you are going to do this uh, military, uh, the use of military forces, uh, bringing stability and, and, and uh, helping, helping states uh, become less fragile, you know, the business is going to be good for the next 50 years and, and more. And, and the problem is, are the militaries capable of, of doing the task, even if they are the only ones that could do, can do something? Because my, my, own, my own kind of uh, thoughts about the, the ongoing and past military operations, looking, at, uh, looking back 25 years, is that uh, uh, the militaries are not delivering too much. Uh, and that is why, for me, it states that uh, we need to redefine uh, the, the tasks uh, and the operations that we actually want to want to engage in. Yeah, the just going back to the female empowerment thing. Part of that whole philosophy is is if you're going to do female empowerment operations and and reliably create a positive outcome, one you have to make mistakes. You're going to that's my that's Pete's number one law of stability operations. Is the first mistake is is not making mistakes. And when you go out and you engage with women, it's got to first start with the commander's ethos. Their ethics has to be such that female engagement is handled with command influence. It's got to define goal and outcome. You're not just going to go visit a, a village once and, and claim victory. Like this is real visceral hard stuff. So if the commander can't redefine ethics and, and pull away from – at some point – you're, I think you reach an ethical saturation where you can only do so many good things. And then once you reach that saturation point, you can't reliably create a good thing. So you have to train hard so that if a fight comes, you can withstand it. That's an ethical, appropriately responsibility for a commander. They have to train on that. But then you can't also reliably go empower females, create rule of law, improve agriculture, because you have to focus all of your energy on combat. So given that, without an orientation change there, you can't go on to the next step, which is engaging the elders, because the elders are the government. And if they're not prepared to deal with female empowerment operations from a foreign power, then that's where the work begins. Not in the village engaging women, but engaging the men and determining what it takes to advance this objective. And then, once you get the permission and the buy-in from these people, and it's it's not forced, they're like, yeah, this is something it's time to do now, then you can go and reliably engage the women. And that even that alone is hard, but that's such a... That's so far down the scale that you can't even get really past the commander stuff very reliably because units rotate in too too frequently and they lose the capacity as they uh, as they change in. Yeah, and I do think the problem is that in many cases the mere presence of foreign militaries on some countries' soil is creating quite a lot of resistance. So it is it is really hard to to take a military force and and do female empowerment or, or some other nation building or, or whatever that is because it will automatically mean that there are interested parties within the state where the operation is taking place that have an interest that the, the foreign military gets out. So it, it, it will, and it's, it's going to be easy to cause havoc and disrupt, disruption, but it's going to be really difficult to bring stability. There is always those people who will have the upper hand in a way of showing that this is not working and this is not working for the long term. So it, that, that's why, again, I, w I would say caution when, when, when starting an operation, even when our, our kind of affective side tells us that this we need to do. But, but it could turn out so that uh, even if our intentions are very good and humanitarian, we may actually uh, bring a lot of misery and, and prolong the situation. As I would say, 
what ha- what we have witnessed in, in Iraq and, and Libya, for example. Yeah, you're right. And and you identified another one of my laws in stability operations is just your mere presence creates t- instability is the norm. And so when yeah. you when the Finnish military and the French military, when the US military when they show up, they contribute to that norm. They contribute to the instability. And it's elastic. You can try to create stability, but the moment you pull back from that, there there's nothing to shore up that instability is the norm it will always go back to that and it's very very tough to defeat that um, right. yeah it's it's a it's a challenging it's a challenging thing but uh, is that where our military needs to focus though is it on these these less lethal gray zone operations is that where our focus needs to be i mean do we do we need to get further from large scale conflict and really work on mastering these affect-based operations? Well, I would say totally the opposite. I would say that uh, actually now it's time to refocus on, on, on the great power things again after after our experiences for the, uh, during the last 25 years uh, concerning the gray zone or hybrid warfare. Uh, I would say that the threats, gray zone threats and, and hybrid threats, uh, they are mostly uh, influencing uh, other authorities than the military. There are some military aspects to it as well. But it's quite a lot of, uh, on, on other authorities. So in a way, you need to have resilience in your societies and, uh, and in your states. Well, majority of gray zone is, is not a military thing. Uh, it's, it's a lot about use of information and it's about threats and uh, it's about terrorism and, and so all, all that. And I would say that terrorism is not a military threat, uh, mostly. We can use military tools against terrorism and I do understand that that is fine in some cases. But the, the highly militarized the kind of a policy that we have had uh, hasn't produced too many good results. So I would say that uh, we are not able to kill enough terrorists at the rate that we are actually producing new ones. So if we do move towards working on those bigger military motions, does that and, and the most powerful man in the world, we always say here in the United States, is the president. And if you've got this enormously powerful military that does big military movements well, how do you keep them in Kansas in the middle of the nation? I mean, you're almost compelled to use them. Is that, at least in terms of the U.S. as a world partner and always trying to do things, how do you keep that power for military out of the fight then, if that's what you focus on? How do you not create more conflict by having this powerful machine? Well, if, if you look back 25 years, I do think that there has been surprisingly many military operations by the West in a situation where the West, Europe and the United States have been extremely secure. Uh, there, ha- there has been no, practically no existential threat for the last 25 years, none. And still there have been so many d- different kinds of military operations, almost globally. So I, I do think that, that we have already uh, stumbled on the, on the notion that uh, the military force needs to be used actively. And, uh, and, and I, I do think that we need some restraint in that. It's a, it's a policy issue. It's also an issue about what kind of militaries do you have and, and how, how often do you want to intervene? Uh, as we started this discussion of talking about the foreign policy establishment in the U.S. and also in Europe, favoring a kind of active role in managing global threats on a, on a global scale, I think that that is something that we need to think about. In which kind of cases and where are the military tools tools going to be useful? I think the militaries are quite crude, even when we have uh, nation building, uh, training, and CIMIC and, and so on. The militaries are rather rather crude tools, uh, and we shouldn't forget that. They are crude tools. <laughs> <laughs> I've hung out with these tools in bars and everything. We are we are a crude lot. Um, one, the most powerful statement I I think I've ever heard in all of the thousands of conversations I've had with locals, and I've said this on the show a bunch of times, but I'm going to keep on saying it is: mm-hmm. there's only room for one sword in the scabbard, and. If you get down at that ground truth level and you really focus on that, that has to be someone other than the commander. But I think you're right. At the strategic level, that sword has to be, you know, I'll say from our point of view, it has to be the U.S., you know, because we have the capacity. We can we can bring in Finns, we can bring in Swedes, we can bring in Germans and work in tandem, and we can make sure that everybody's fed, there's enough fuel, you guys aren't breaking your entire budget. We export security. It's what we do. It's it's interesting. I don't feel like we've even scratched the surface on, on what we can talk about here because I, d- I definitely want to get into a couple things. I, I'm going to 
I'm going to give you one more question of me if you want it. But first, let me just ask you this. What, what's, what's your take on females in combat roles? We're, we're learning about this here in the U.S. now. There's a lot of consternation and worry. What are your thoughts? Well, in our, in our system, we have had females in the military approximately, approximately 25 years. Becoming, in a way, normal, commonplace so that everybody understands and it doesn't raise our eyebrows anymore. So I, I do think that uh, in our case, where we mainly focus on, on defense capability for our own area, uh, for our own protection, uh, and we have the system, military system of having citizen soldiers, big reserves. So I do think that uh, it is it's a good thing that uh, we have males and females also, voluntary females as, as part of our wartime troops. All right. Yeah, I agree, too. From my experience, I've seen a lot of females in combat roles, and they, they do just fine. Are they, are they as good at men at all things? No, but that's also true of men. They're not as good as women at other things, so that's good. Hey, do you got a last question for me before we wrap it up? Yeah, well, I could ask you about North Korea. Uh, mm -hmm. do, you, do you see, looking at from the U.S., how do you see it? Is it, is it actually something that uh, might demand military action uh, if the diplomatic efforts now will, will turn sour? Well, I mean, if the diplomatic efforts turn sour, I, I think we reach a military inevitability. You know, we have to do something. Um, the problem is, is that South Korea is a fully stable, world-class nation, and uh, we can't just throw that away. And, of course, China has a role. So it's something that it can't just, gosh, I hope it's not just something that's done by our president in terms of bringing something large in. I, I do think that we might see some kind of surgical strike where, okay, listen, we're going to bring you back to the table, but we're going to do that by hitting these things. This only gets worse if we go down this road and they're compelled to come to the table because of that. I, I think that's the escalation that we do, kind of like we did in Syria, where Syria crossed another line. And so then the, our president said, OK, well, we're, we're going to blow up this airfield. And, you know, there's some back channeling that happens. Putin knows in advance, clear people out of this area. This is going to happen. Pick a target from these three. And then, you know, it goes out and the attack is, is, is completed. I can see something like that happening. I hope okay. that it isn't bigger because as a guy that has to go fight these kind of fights, I, I sure as heck would rather stay home and not have to go deal with this. <laughs> well, I, I'm all, all for diplomacy as well. Yeah, political answer is the best. Okay, so let me uh, let me wrap everything up here. Hey, uh, where can people find more about you? How do we? I, I mean, you're you're doing it right now. You're this mysterious military Finnish officer. How do we find out more about what you do, what you write about, and and get to know your work a little more? Well, you can look at my LinkedIn profile, Yuri Raitasalo, J Y R I R A I. C-A-S-A-L-O. So I have my work there, so you can look what I've been writing. And I'll put Yuri's uh, LinkedIn profile in the show notes and be glad to give it to everybody. If you want to reach out and you can't remember that and you can't spell Yuri because it's, it's he's Finn, so it spells a little different than you might expect. But you can reach out at me at Pete A. Turner or at BreakItDownShow.com on Twitter, and I will be glad to uh, get you over to where he is at. Man, I would love to come back to you. And anytime you have something you want to talk about, boy, I would love to have you on because the more worldly we can keep this show the more we can all get to know each other and get along better Pete, i really enjoyed the discussion and i also feel that we just scratched the surface so i will be glad to continue someday in the future 